Welcome back to Trip to the Mound again. We are the iBaseball Channel Podcast. We are now sitting here in our makeshift uh, little studio arrangement for the moment. We're looking good. Everything's held up during the course of the show so far. So everything. Yep. And we're looking for some feedback on our new equipment, our new cameras. We're going to, this next segment will be produced with our new uh, equipment uh, as a result of our little trip into the Gilroy capital of the world. Yes. Yeah. And, and while, while people oh. are seeing it, again, we were going to reintroduce your shirt one more time. So again, it's Harvey. It's, yeah. Har- it's Hogeny is Harvey's last name, but he's the clubby, the visiting side uh, at, at uh, AT&T Giants. And uh, everybody always says, how do you pronounce that? And so we made him some shirts. And he says, just put, how's your knee on there? And so we put that on there for him, made him some shirts. So I have my Harvey Hodgeny, uh, you know, kind of my, uh, what do you call it? The uh, inaugural t-shirt from 1986. Yes, yeah. And and yes, I have not been pumping iron. This is uh, what happened to it after it hit the <laughs> the uh, commercial dryers after a couple of wide shrunk. And, and I've shrunk, and I'm still big for it, so that tells you. <laughs> Show, that shows everything we need to What's know. What's going yeah. on? Absolutely. And while and while we are talking about the '80s again, this segment is specifically taking us back to the '80s a little. One of the things that I noticed over the weekend again, 1989 is obviously a celebratory year when you're looking back at 25 years of what we've talked about with the Bay Bridge series. Obviously, the contributions of both the A's and the Giants during that time. Well, what happened this past weekend was the Oakland A's decided to have a 1989 tribute come back to them. So what they did is they welcomed back members of the Bash Brother team, but there's one specific member that this was his first trip back to Oakland since a key event in his career happened, and that man is Jose Canseco. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the first time that Canseco has been welcomed back since his book Juiced came out. Again, this was something that happened at the latter part of his career. And one of the things that he specifically addressed over the weekend was how he regretted ever coming clean in the first place. Now, again, were you, how were aware of this book were you when it came out? I was aware of it, and I uh, really didn't care that much you know, about it because I haven't been that big of a Jose fan in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, hey, I, I believe you know, his, his motivations in the beginning were to make money off the book, not just, you know, spill the beans on, on everybody. That's the allure of making a a book is the hype about, oh, he's going to, he's going to say something, you know, out there to, that nobody's going to know. Yeah. And so with that, they buy your book Uh, and they did, I think, I think he sold quite a few in that first round, but sold one to me. He did. Yes, he did. I, I did. Re- I well, read it when it first came out. So yeah, and so what happens is, I, I believe he just mismanaged his his concept, you know, of where he was going with this. He probably should have wrote another book or two and and whatever. But you know, instead he parlayed it his you know his uh, his new branding from the book, you know, to getting beat up in the boxing ring, to getting caught going 120 miles an hour with a gun and the reality television the, came not that, too far after all kinds that. of stuff you know and he's getting in, you know he's this and that it's like he doesn't really think about some things once in a while i guess and he hasn't uh yeah he probably regrets it from a sense that it's brought the attention to him but you and i have talked many times about you know sometimes bad press is is good press you know it's how it's how you handle it and what you do with it i don't think he handled it very well yeah to be honest with you he just you know, like i said went off if he would have maybe come out with a a sympathetic you know book following that you know or maybe a like a part two you know uh, and uh yeah i'm sure he knows a lot more than what's in that book yeah since I, he's already spilled the beans hey tell some more stuff and maybe you know back off a little bit you know and make it a little bit more sensitive or less sensitive or whatever but he had people's interests, and I think he just mismanaged uh, after the book. I don't think he had a plan for after the book. You know, he was mad at Major League Baseball for not for not letting him in. You know, he thinks he should be in the Hall of Fame and the you know the All Stars, whatever, all the stuff that he thought was going to happen to him <clears throat> post playing career, and it hasn't. So he's been mad about this and mad about that, and. He just does stuff, you know, that... Well, I think that's where a lot of where that book came from at that time and place. Yeah, is it, I'll show was, you. The wound was fresh, and yeah. so you were still watching 
the the hammer had not yet fallen on this performance enhancing drugs thing. So at the time, there were guys that were still making money off of it. They were still prospering from it. And I think that he said, you know, while you guys are doing this, let me just go ahead and spill the beans and tell you some things that may change your mind about it. And again, I, I mean, taking it back to, I was one of those people that bought the book when it first came out. I, you know, as I did not have a career in professional baseball, I found it fascinating that somebody was to bring some of this stuff to light. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize, and again, this was something that yourself and some of your former players have brought to my attention through that time, is it was not unlike what Jim Bouton done with Ball Four. Again, this was really one of those exposés where you're coming out from the locker room in a sense where the unspoken rule is you're not supposed to do so with this. Well, yeah, but... Still, I mean, again, what was motivating him to do it? And that's what you really got to take a, you know, what you got to, you know, get a, a handle on it and accept. He did it. He was mad. But then again, he probably had people say, oh, you'll sell, you know, a couple million of these things. And so that probably sent him over the edge, the financial aspect of it. But but he just didn't plan. I should have known uh, you know, even the thing we posted you know, about the, you know, the cheerleader on a safari, you know, I've, I've, people are sending me, you know, hate mail, you know, that they're going to do that. It's just what you do with it. Yes. You know, when yeah. you get it. And I don't think he's, I don't think he was smart about, you know, what kind of a career or anything he was going to get involved in post playing. I would have, you know, he could have done a lot of stuff, you know, he could have been a scout, you know, and, and a lot of stuff, you know, hit, uh, besides, oh, he could have been a hitting coach. No, there's a lot of places in baseball where he could have, you know, probably gotten involved, but he just went the other direction. You know, yeah. He didn't want to work for He hated all the teams, and they were all against him and, and all that stuff. And so and that stuff happens, but... Mm -hmm.